Hi there, I'm Lisa Bronner, and I am here to start our third session in Experiments in Soap. I'm going to wait a few minutes to let other people join us, but I wanted to greet those of you who are here early, so thanks so much for joining me. If you haven't had a chance to see my first two sessions, uh, head on over to the video section of the Going Green Facebook page. They are both there. And if you um, have seen them, uh, that'll be good because I'm going to uh, mention a couple things from them later on in our session this morning or this afternoon, goodness. Um, one thing I wanted to uh, follow up on, and this might be something you've thought about yourself, you know, there's so much discussion right now about how to clean and how to wash our hands and how to wash surfaces and that sort of thing. And so one thing that I realize that people are hearing different uh, recommendations and they might not know why is the length of time. Now for our hands, we all have kind of gotten used to the 20 seconds, and that's true. Wash your hands with soap for 20 seconds. But sometimes when you're washing a surface, like the directions might say you'll leave it on there for 10 minutes. So what's the difference? Why does it take 10 minutes to clean a surface and 20 seconds to wash your hands? Well, the issue is, or the, the difference is what it is you're using to clean. So when we wash our hands, we use soap, and soap removes. I talked about that last week. Soap, soap surrounds dirt and grime, and it removes it. Um, but oftentimes, what people conventionally use to clean surfaces in their house are uh, things that kill, like a bleach or uh, a disinfectant. Those aren't removing. Those are actually killing. And so they need a little bit longer to work, uh, 10 minutes. Now, soap will remove, even if it's something on, on a surface, such as a counter. Um, it doesn't need the 10 minutes in order to remove. Uh, but that's the difference. If you ever are wondering, well, why, why would this cleaner need 10 minutes when soap needs 20 seconds? Um, it is because of the removing versus the killing. So, uh, you know, whatever your cleaner you're using, you do want to look and see how long it takes to be effective. Because if, if you use it wrong, it won't be effective. And you'll think you've cleaned something when you really haven't. So that was just a little thought that I, I realized it might be... Uh, I don't know, on the top of some people's minds these days as we think about keeping ourselves and our surroundings clean. So um, we are going to start in just a minute or two. Um, I have out here some uh, tools I use, and these are just my favorite kinds of tools because they're things I find around the house. I have kids. I have three of them. They are maybe a tiny bit old for Tinker Toys, but here I am at my age playing with Tinker Toys, so I guess they're not. Um, Anyhow, so I'm going to look forward to sharing with you why I have a spirograph circle and tinker toys here. Our topic today is how do elephants brush their teeth? And um, I hope that you will enjoy learning the answer to that question uh, because um, this, uh, this is an experiment I just used... Uh, this is an experiment I just learned about myself a couple months ago. My teenage son showed it to me, and I thought, wow, that is really cool, and I'm seeing a lot of soap science happening there, and so I wanted to bring uh, that demonstration to you, make it an experiment by asking some questions so that we can all learn a little bit more about soap, about stuff that we use every day in the world around us. So I'm so glad you're here today. So once again, my name is Lisa Bronner. I write the blog Going Green with Lisa Bronner, as well as uh, run the Facebook page Going Green. And I love to teach. I love to answer questions. I love to help people um, uh, get along easier in their daily lives as far as uh, keeping themselves and their, their areas clean and healthy. Um, I, my background is in teaching, but I haven't done that officially for a long time, but I kind of see what I do with my work as, as teaching, except my classroom happens to be uh, the internet. My connection here is that I'm part of the Bronner family that runs, uh, owns, operates Dr. Bronner's. They make uh, natural organic. Uh, fair trade body care products, um, our Castile soaps, what people most know us for. Uh, so that's, that's my background, and, but I prefer to interact with uh, consumers, with people who are just living their daily lives. So that's my, my role. I've uh, been running this series called Experiments in Soap this summer, partially because we all might need a little bit more to do, uh, maybe kids especially, um, and so I wanted to have a series that would be accessible for kids, but also teach adults a lot about soap science and the chemistry of soap. Um, and also just to have fun. I love doing experiments. I love seeing science at work. Uh, so, you know, I figured, well, I'll combine what I think is fun with my work here. So today is our third session, my final session for now. 
Uh, and our topic today is how do elephants brush their teeth? Now the answer to that is with elephant toothpaste, of course. Now we're gonna be making some of that elephant toothpaste in just a few minutes. Now elephant toothpaste is made up of a whole bunch of bubbles. It, it's foam and foam is made of bubbles. And so the topic today really is bubbles. What are they? Uh, how are they formed? What is their structure? Why do we associate them with cleaning? Uh, it's something I answer all the time. Why are there bubbles? Why aren't there bubbles? Do I need bubbles? I don't see bubbles. Uh, so let's talk about bubbles. So the structure of a bubble. You know, if you have just plain water, so here in this mason jar, I have just plain water, and I shake it, you're gonna see bubbles for a moment, okay? A moment, right? But not very long. That's not enough. So plain water is not enough to make bubbles. Although I will tell you that water itself is a crucial ingredient to making bubbles. Now, if I take soap, this is some Dr. Bronner's Castile peppermint, sealed. Let me take that seal off so I can get to the soap. Okay, I'm gonna add in a good squirt of soap into my mason jar here. Okay, now I'm gonna shake it. What's gonna happen? I bet you can guess. There we go. I shake it and we have bubbles. So we needed two things there. We needed water and we needed soap, but why? That's the question I wanna look at. So if you, um, if you joined me for my last two sessions, you learned two key abilities of soap. They both come into play with the formation of bubbles. The first one is that soap reduces surface tension, and the second is that soap is a strange molecule that is attracted to water on one end and attracted to grease or oil on the other end. And so both of those come into play here. First off, water has very high surface tension. We talked about that in the first episode. That's why it balls up. That's why it beads up on a surface. That's why belly flops hurt. Water wants to ball up. Now, a ball isn't a bubble. So left to its own devices, water is going to clench up. It's not going to expand into a bubble. So you need the soap to, let, to make the water relax, to make it let go so it can expand and form a bubble that has gas in the middle. So the first thing that soap does that makes bubbles is it, it releases the surface tension. The second thing it does is it actually insulates the water because the surface of a bubble is water surrounded by soap inside and outside. And it's that, that ability of soap, that molecule that has that water loving end that's actually holding on to the water on the top and on the bottom. And that, um, that water loving end is, is causing a film of soap over the water and it's actually insulating it so that the water doesn't evaporate. Because what makes bubbles pop? Either running into something or just simply evaporation. Uh, the water turns into gas uh, and it, it, it pops the bubble. So the soap is coating it with its, its um, water loving end. So last week I made this very fancy mo uh, molecule, a, a water molecule out of Tinker Toys. Roughly, this idea was that the head of a water molecule is, uh, um, I'm so sorry, I do that every time. The, this is a soap molecule. The head of the soap molecule is attracted to water and the tail of a soap molecule is attracted to grease. And so what we have here on the surface of a bubble is that the, uh, the water-loving head of a soap molecule is coating the water. Now, to make an example of this, I, uh, I made, I snagged this, um, it's actually from my daughter's spirograph set, uh, so that you could see it. Now, if you took a cross-section of a bubble, you cut it in half, this is roughly, magnified many times, what you would see. I'm gonna have my, my son zoom in here so that you could see this. Um, and what I'm, what I'm showing you is that you have water, that's I put the and then the red is representing soap. And so the red is representing all the soap molecules uh, coating the water, covering it, protecting it from evaporation. I even like the fact that this spirograph circle has the pointy uh, edges because that's almost like the tail of the soap molecule sticking out. And so it's doing it on the inside and, and on the outside. So it's making a bit of a sandwich. This is what the surface of a soap molecule, uh, of, a, of a bubble, actually looks like. 
it's got, it's got the water and then the sandwich of the soap. Have you ever noticed that a soap molecule, um, well, let me say that another way. Have you ever noticed that a bubble looks kind of oily? Have you ever seen a bubble up close and the surface of it, it's like moving and it's iridescent and it looks kind of, kind of oily? Well, that's because you've got that oil-loving tail sticking out all over it and it's, it's, um, it's, it's in constant motion. And the water-loving head of the, of the soap is attached to the, wa um, to the water in the, in the bubble. And so this is what you have with bubbles. It's why you need soap and water to make a bubble, but that's not it. What's in here? What's in here is gas, any gas. It doesn't have to be air. It could be any, any gas can fill it. You can have lots of fun actually with um, dry ice bubbles, which maybe we'll do in another session. So this is the structure of a bubble. Now, all of that being said, are we, we zoomed back out there, Nate? Okay, all of that being said, what does that have to do with cleaning? This is the myth. Bubbles have nothing to do with cleaning. You can clean without bubbles, and bubbles doesn't indicate the presence of a cleaner. Uh, bubbles are fun. The, we associate them with cleaning. We think about them with a bubble bath, with our dish soap, that sort of thing. Um, but they don't have any impact on the cleaning. So the presence of bubbles alone is actually completely irrelevant. It's fun, but it's completely irrelevant. So, for example, a common question I get is like, why does Dr. Bronner's soap not bubble as much as this other product I was using? And it's actually because uh, we don't add any synthetic bubbling agent to our soap because it's pointless. Um, so that's a common cleaning myth that you need bubbles in order to clean or that bubbles being there indicates that there's soap. It, there could be bubbles and no cleaning power. There could be cleaning power and no bubbles. So um, that's kind of something we have to retrain our brain as, as far as, uh, as cleaning goes. So that's the structure of a bubble, a sandwich of water with soap uh, with gas in the middle. So that's, uh, now that you know what a bubble is, let's make some. Now, I thought about we could make bubble solution, but I don't know, that's, uh, that's been done before. I've done it myself. Instead, we're gonna make elephant toothpaste. So let me uh, show you our ingredients. And if you had a chance to grab these yourself, you can do it right here with me. And if you didn't, just watch this time and maybe do it yourself afterwards. So <clears throat> the key ingredients are peroxide. You might think, oh, that's something you know we use on a cut. About that, why? Uh, but this is hydrogen peroxide, and we're going to use soap. And then we're going to use yeast. You think about yeast with baking. Now, the very same reason we use it in baking is actually why we're going to use it here, is that yeast, when it breaks down, releases a gas, and uh, it creates bubbles, actually. It, ca and it causes a reaction that creates uh, a gas that's going to make our bubbles for us, so that's pretty key. And then we're going to use some food coloring just to make it fun. Uh, I want to talk about hydrogen peroxide, though, because... Uh, it's this that's going to be our magic. Uh, what's in here is what's going to be our gas. So let me show you another great uh, use of Tinker Toys here. Uh, this is a hydrogen peroxide molecule. Now, if you know a little bit of chemistry, uh, maybe it will make sense for me to say that hydrogen peroxide is H2O2. It means there's one hydrogen for every oxygen, a hydrogen per oxide. Hydrogen peroxide. So now you think, wow, that sounds really similar to something else I know. Water. This is water. So what's the difference? An extra oxygen molecule. Water is H2O and hydrogen peroxide is H2O2. Now hydrogen peroxide is unstable. It doesn't like having this extra oxygen uh, molecule on here. It's like it's like an unnecessary guest at the party. And hydrogen peroxide actually wants to lose this oxygen molecule. That is why hydrogen peroxide always comes in these ugly brown bottles, because the thing that makes it lose that is, is light or heat, um, and something else that we're going to, to uh, bring about with the yeast. And so we're gonna take advantage of the fact that hydrogen peroxide is unstable. It wants to get rid of this oxygen molecule. It's going to become then we're going to take that oxygen molecule off and we're going to have this 
We're going to separate it out. And so what are we going to have? We're going to have oxygen with leftover H2O or water. OK, so let's make that reaction happen. Now, if you had a chance to gather your ingredients, you know I said to get a large rimmed pan. Uh, this is not a dangerous reaction at all, but it would be very messy. Hmm? Uh, not yet. All right, so now I got myself several bottles here because I want to do this a couple times just for fun. I got some different shapes. We're going to use some different ingredients. The first time we do it is going to be a demonstration. If you remember, a demonstration is when you do something and you know what's going to happen. I know what's going to happen. I've done it before. The second time we, I do this is going to be an experiment because I'm going to ask some questions. I'm going to do things a little bit differently, and I'm not quite sure what's going to happen. Um, I know theoretically what I expect to happen. I have a hypothesis, which is my guess as to what's going to happen, but I'm not entirely sure. So let's start with our demonstration. So I'm going to put my bottle here, uh, and I'm going to add to that half a cup of our hydrogen peroxide. Now, hydrogen peroxide comes at various concentrations. And what we get at the pharmacy and what we put on our cuts is 3%. And that's very mild. It's not going to, obviously, it's not going to hurt us. OK, and then I'm going to add a quarter cup of soap. All right, now just for fun and so that we can see the reaction a little bit better, I'm going to add some food coloring. So I'm going to put blue. Uh, because that's what I did before. And I think it looks pretty cool as it blends. I'm going to go ahead and combine that. Then I'm going to do something else for fun. Um, because I did this and it was very a little bit more fun, I'm going to drip some purple down the sides just to make it a little bit snazzier. OK. Next, I'm going to take our yeast. Now, yeast is kind of funny because it looks, you know, like a powder, like, like flour maybe or cornmeal, uh, but it's actually alive. Yeast is, is technically a fungus. Um, and when it reacts, it, it has an enzyme in it, rather, an enzyme called catalase, and that is what we want to use here. OK, the other thing I said to have is very warm water. And that's really just to dissolve the yeast, to give the yeast a little bit of a head start. So I'm dissolving the yeast right here. It's going to turn into a very unattractive liquid, I have to say. Um, I'm going to mix that up until it is fully a liquid. And it smells, well, depending upon your druthers, it either smells like bread or it smells like beer. Because beer also uses the same, um, uh, well, substance. OK, now this is our reactant. Now, the reason why we have to have a reactant is because on its own, we're not going to get many bubbles. Now, right now in this bottle, I've got everything that we need for bubbles. I have soap. Um, I have hydrogen peroxide, which has a water molecule on it. And there's air, right? But I'm not getting many molecules because I need some sort of force or agitation. Um, so Nate, could you come up to see all of me and the bottle and everything? You saw me just stick my finger in it. Yeasty water is not a problem. It smells a little strange, but it's not harmful. 
Okay, so as I said, in order to make bubbles, we need force. We need, we need, we need a agitation. If you think about it, like what does it take to make bubbles with a bubble wand? You have to blow or you have to have wind um, or I have to shake my jar or maybe in the, in the bathtub you need the water like plunging into the tub to make the bubbles. If you just pour a bubble bath into water, it doesn't do anything. You need something to mix things up a bit. So that's what our yeast is going to do. That ingredient or that element in yeast, the catalase, is going to knock that oxygen molecule off of the hydrogen peroxide and going to cause it to shoot into the soapy water and um, cause it to spread out and make bubbles. So that's what's going to happen here. That's why this is a demonstration because I know what's going to happen. Okay, now I'm going to move everything aside so that you can see this reaction. All right, ready? Here we go. It's going to make that reaction super fast. There we go. There we go. Okay. So there it goes. All bubbles. I know these are tiny bubbles. Oops. Tiny bubbles. But nonetheless, these are, are foam. Uh, foam is just made up of lots and lots of tiny bubbles. And if you watch this reaction, it's going to go on for a long time because the, um, the catalase in the yeast is knocking that oxygen off the hydrogen peroxide, causing it to slam into the water, the soapy water, and uh, making, it, making it form bubbles. Each one of these bubbles is a little ball of gas surrounded by that sandwich of soap uh, uh, with water in between. So if you can think about... If you can think about every one of these tiny bubbles we're seeing is, is, is this sandwich with the, with the water and the soap on the inside and the outside. Now what I found when I did this before is that this went on for quite some time. Um, and the more, like every time I'd step away and then look back at it, it looked a little different. So that was kind of neat. This is, uh, what we have here is soap. And now, since uh, the extra oxygen molecule has been knocked off of our hydrogen peroxide, we have water, we have oxygen, we have food coloring. Nothing that's left in here is in any way harmful. But this is interesting. It's warm. If you do this and you touch it, it's warm. Because that reaction that knocked the oxygen off of our hydrogen peroxide molecule, it created heat. Now, the yeasty water I put in was a, was a little warm, but not, not warm enough to cause this all to be warm. It's not dangerously warm. It's not hot. I'm touching it just fine. Um, but that's an interesting thing. You're feeling uh, that, that it released heat, and um, that is called an exothermic reaction. It released some heat. So a lot going on there. Honestly, I absolutely love this shade of blue. I don't know if you can see, but I've got some nice purple stripes going up my bottle here. Um, and that's all caused from the, uh, the foam coming straight out. All right, so that was pretty cool. That was a demonstration. I knew what was going to happen there. Um, I've done it before. Let's ask some questions and turn this into an experiment. Now let me clean up real quick. Now let me rinse my hands off. This is perfectly fine to go down the drain. As I said, all we have here now is soap and water and oxygen. You really just need to rinse it because, as I said, you've got soap there. So it's kind of a self-washing experiment, as you would say. Okay. So the water in that um, the water in that in that demonstration came from the hydrogen peroxide. The soap was not there to clean anything. It was only there to break the surface tension of the water and to protect the foam from um, uh, evaporating. So eventually, that whole tub of, of foam I had here would, would evaporate. It doesn't protect it forever from evaporating. Uh, it would eventually evaporate, and then there would just be like a little bit of water left in here. So let's try it again. Okay, I've got the same bottle. I'm going to put hydrogen peroxide in. This time, I'm not going to use the soap. 
I'm going to use the other Dr. Bronner cleaner, which is Salsuds. Now, Salsuds is a biodegradable detergent. It has the same properties of soap in that it's a surfactant, it, uh, which means it, it decreases surface tension. It also has the same fancy molecule that's attracted to water at one end and attracted to oil at the other. So we're going to use Salsuds. This is uh, the household cleaner. Okay, I'm going to put in, again, a quarter cup. Let's see what, what difference this makes. Again, I'm not sure what it's going to do because either the Salsuds is, is thicker, so it might not move as fast as the soap, but it's more concentrated. Not sure that's going to matter, though. I forgot to tell you something you can do here. I have my cousin waiting in the wings to answer any questions you have. If you have any questions about what's going on here, put them in the comments, and Daniel Bronner will be answering them. He just graduated with a brand new degree in chemistry and math, and so he is ready to take your questions. Okay, so I've got that in there. I've got hydrogen peroxide in there. And now I need our yeast. I'm going to rinse this out. All right, I'm going to put in a tablespoon of yeast and a little bit more warm water. Uh, roughly, I'm doing three tablespoons, but you can see I'm not measuring. So it's just enough to dissolve the yeast. Now, it is important that the yeast dissolves. You want it to be liquid because then it will be available to react. So I'm going to give that a moment. And while that's dissolving, I'm going to make it fancy here with a little bit of red food coloring this time. The food coloring is just for fun. This is not part of the reaction. Here, I'll drip some down the side, so hopefully we'll get some neat streaks. This was an olive oil bottle, a glass one, by the way. It actually still has its label on, so I forgot to take that off. All righty, so our, my yeast is just about dissolved. It's kind of gummy. All right, so remember, this is an experiment because instead of soap, I have used salsuds. Now, with experiments, you only want to change one thing at a time. If I changed, like, the bottle and the soap and the amount of yeast, that's too many changes, so I wouldn't be able to tell what made the difference. <clears throat> so whenever you do an experiment, you want to change one thing at a time. Everything else serves as what they call a control. What's super fun about my teaching this is I actually did not teach science. I taught English. But my dad was a chemist, and he didn't go to school for chemistry. He was entirely self-taught. So I guess I've kind of followed in his footsteps. All right, so here we go. We have, again, we are pouring the warm water yeast, yeasty water in here, and we're going to see this reaction. There we go. Okay. You know what? I would say this is happening a little bit faster, a little bit faster this time than with the soap. So the salsuds, as I said, is a little more concentrated than the Castile soap, and so I think we're seeing a slightly faster reaction. The other thing I'm noticing is that the foam is a little stiffer, it's a little higher here, and so we're seeing, um, we're seeing that difference here. It still worked. Uh, the principle is still the same. The, ox the yeast released the oxygen from the hydrogen peroxide. It slammed into the soapy water and is creating foam. So that worked. All right, and it's still going. Uh, as I said, I, we could watch this for a while, and in, when you do it on your own, I would, I would encourage you to watch it for a while so that you can um, uh, see what happens over time. Uh, let it sit, and eventually you'll notice that the bubbles are going to pop, and you're going to end up with just water. Go ahead and, and touch your reaction so that you can feel that, indeed, it creates heat. You've got a nice exothermic reaction right there. So lots of fun science going on uh, with this one. All right, now one thing I'm going to change, I, I honestly want to sit here and watch it, but that's not all that interesting on Facebook Live, so I'm going to go ahead and, um, and 
uh, clean this, I want to do a different bottle. Now, I'm going to use this old Sal Suds bottle. Um, and as you can see, it's fatter. It's a wider bottle. So is that going to change our reaction at all? Um, this one is a fairly narrow bottle, and it has this fairly narrow neck. So let's give that a try. Okay, um, you know what? I'm actually going to change my mind. I'm going to change the mic question. I'm not going to use a different bottle. I'm going to use the same bottle. I have something that's a little less common to find, and that is 6% hydrogen peroxide. That's going to be what I change. So I'm going to clean out our first bottle. It's okay if it's wet because water isn't a problem in this experiment. I remember the first time my ninth grade science teacher told me how to empty a bottle fast. I've never emptied a bottle the same way. And just give it a little spin, create a nice little vortex, and there you go. Okay. So instead of changing the bottle, I decided I want to change the hydrogen peroxide. So the, this is 3% hydrogen peroxide, uh, and it's what you can commonly find. But for fun, I ordered from a chemistry uh, supply site 6% hydrogen peroxide. Now I had it covered with a towel, because as I mentioned, uh, hydrogen peroxide is sensitive to light. Light will eventually cause this to break down. So I kept that covered. So now I'm going to go ahead and put my half cup of hydrogen peroxide in there. I think the sal suds worked a little better than the soap, so I'm going to go with that. Remember, you only want to change one thing at a time, but I already know what the sal suds did, so that's not a change. So quarter cup. All right, a little bit of yeasty water. I'm telling you, this smells very strange, especially because I have peppermint soap and yeast. That is kind of an odd combination. The salsa smells like pine, so that's pine and yeast. I don't know if that's any better. Okay, I'm dissolving the yeast. It's got to be liquid or else it, it won't happen fast enough. We need that reaction to happen fast in order for the oxygen to slam into the soapy water. Um, and let's see. Let's go with purple this time. I'll give that a mix. A little extra down the side. So remember my change here is that I have a 6% hydrogen peroxide. That means that there's more uh, hydrogen peroxide molecules in the solution. There's twice as many. I'm going to get that liquid. You know what? I don't think I put enough water in there. All right, so. Um, hypothesis. So I doubled the, the concentration of the hydrogen peroxide, so I think this reaction will happen faster, and I think it might possibly shoot out of the top of the bottle. That's my guess. Okay. Let's see. Here we go. We ready? Whoa! Yes, it did. Look at that. Fantastic. So that is double the amount uh, concentration of hydrogen peroxide. Definitely happened much faster. We had a little bit of a geyser, and we definitely have a lot higher of foam happening here in the, um, in the pan. So that was fun. All right, so tons of bubbles. That's what I'm looking at. Foam is bubbles. So if uh, you remember back to what I said a moment ago, uh, Nate, if we can... 
I have my, my son, Nate, working with me today. As you know, we are all working from home, so I don't have my normal work crew, so he is... <laughs> all right, so remember what I said about bubbles. Bubbles are fun. Um, bubbles are part of soap because soap, the ability of soap happens to make bubbles, but bubbles are not integral to cleaning. Um, so even though we like them, they make us happy, they make us smile, uh, they are not an essential part of cleaning. And so this is just something that we can, uh, you know, use to bring joy to our days and that sort of thing. I realized I didn't touch this. I would have thought maybe it would have been significantly warmer, but it's not significantly warmer. It is still warm. Lots of bubbles there. So I encourage you to do this experiment if you can gather the ingredients. Um, you might even look on YouTube. You can find uh, other um, other ingredients that were used to do this, but they were actually a little bit more dangerous uh, using like, um, you can get hydrogen peroxide in even greater uh, concentrations. You can use other things that cause that oxygen to fly off. Um, uh, and, and all that is is it's causing the reaction to happen a lot faster. Um, but there's even a Guinness World Record about elephant toothpaste. So if you want to look that up and see a really nifty video, you can see, you can, uh, can research that. So I thank you for joining me for... Um, experiments in soap for all three sessions if you did. And if you have any questions, put them in the comments anytime. I'll still get them even if I'm no longer live. Um, and so I thank you for, for being part of my um, day. Have a great day and I hope to see you again on the Going Green Facebook page. I'm Lisa Bronner with Going Green. Bye-bye.